you have your Bibles today, turn them to Leviticus chapter 3, or chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23, starting with verse 9. So before we get there, I want to tell you about something that my family was able to do during this uh, isolation period. Last year, my grandmother came to visit us, and uh, I took her to Callaway Gardens. And while we were at Callaway Gardens, uh, we went to the butterfly house. And uh, this is, of course, this is before all of this happened, so the, the gift store was open. And in the Butterfly House gift store, uh, they have, or gift shop, they have uh, a, it's like a, it's a net. It looks like almost one of those collapsible um, trash cans that's like mesh, um, or, or uh, sometimes, I guess they're, uh, I don't know if they're trash cans, but like... Uh, Laundry baskets, you know, those collapsible laundry baskets. Uh, and what it is, is uh, it's a butterfly house. And uh, so you, you get this thing, and you, you send this thing in the mail, and they send you a little container with all kinds of weird, I guess, caterpillar food in the bottom of it, and like four or five caterpillars in it. So you set... Uh, this thing out on the table, and you watch as these gross little caterpillars uh, eat the stuff in the bottom of it. I still don't know exactly what it is. We just call it caterpillar food. And they they eat this stuff in the bottom of it, and they get fat, right? I mean, you've read the story of the hungry caterpillar, right? He ate this and this and this, and, and then he was a big fat caterpillar, right? So they eat all this stuff, and then you get to watch as they slowly crawl up the side of the container and attach themselves to the lid of this container. Okay? And then they form a chrysalis. Is that, is that right, Ella? It's called a chrysalis, right? Yeah, she's shaking her head. She knows. Okay? Then they form a chrysalis. And so all this time, there's this, it's so exciting, you know, you get to watch this nasty process of these caterpillars uh, eating and then crawling up the side and, and then hanging from the top. And it's just this fascinating process that you get to watch. But then once they form the chrysalis, then you have to wait. And I'll tell you what, with three little girls that wanted to see some butterflies waiting on the chrysalis to open up and the butterfly to come out was excruciating. It was horrible. It was horrible. Uh, every day, mom, dad, when, when are we going to have butterflies? When are they going to come out of the chrysalis? I mean, it was, it was all the time. It was every day. So we, have, uh, we had one runt that didn't make it up the side. I don't know what happened. Uh, he, I guess he just didn't get enough to eat. I don't know. I don't, he didn't make it up. So he died. Uh, but we had three caterpillars that made it up, formed chrysalises. Chrysalis, I don't know. I don't know what the plural of that is. Okay? They formed them, and, and then after a long time, it seemed like, after forever, they break out, and they, they fly out, and they're in, they're in this little laundry basket thing, and they fly around, and you get to look at them for a few days, and then you let them go. And it was a, a fascinating process to behold, uh, but the weight... The wait was not fun. It was not fun to have to sit there and wait for them to to come out. Maybe you've had a similar experience. Maybe you got excited about something. You you had a taste for something great, and uh, you waited with excited expectation to experience it in its fullness. You wanted to see uh, the real deal. I mean, it's great to see caterpillars, but you want to see butterflies, right? Right? Jesus' ministry had been building up to this idea. The apostles had the same feeling 
after the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus' ministry had been building up to this. He had done great works. He did wonders. He'd done miracles. He'd done signs. Uh, and he had showed that nothing would ever have power over him. He had, show, he had shown his, his kingdom to be the greatest kingdom that could ever exist. He opened up the curtain and showed people his kingdom, uh, what his kingdom would be like. And the apostles saw all of this. I mean, they saw him walk on water. They saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. I mean, they smelled Lazarus. They knew that Lazarus was dead. They smelled Lazarus, and then they saw Jesus say, Lazarus, get up. Come forth. They saw that. And then Jesus gets murdered. Then Jesus gets murdered, and everything was over, and they all went back to their lives. But then, but then, God brings Jesus back from the dead, and the game is on again. And the disciples know that Jesus, they know now that Jesus is going to change the world. They know that the resurrection changes everything. And Jesus tells them to wait in Jerusalem for a sign. And I don't believe that it is any coincidence that this happens on the day of Pentecost, that they receive this sign. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. So, today, according to the calendar, is the day of Pentecost. It is 50 days after uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 50 days after that. And so what is Pentecost? Now, Pentecost means uh, 50th. It's the 50th day. It, this is the, the Greek way or the Roman way, um, depending on how you want to look at it. It, it was the, the pagan way of <laughs> referring to the Jewish festival known as the Feast of Weeks. Okay? It was referring to the Feast of Weeks. And that feast is talked about in Leviticus chapter 23. So I hope you'll grab your Bibles. Leviticus chapter 23. So I wanted to talk about Pentecost today, but I wanted to keep with our theme. I wanted to keep with our theme of hindsight is 2020, looking back to the Old Testament. Hindsight is 2020. And so Leviticus chapter 23, verse 9. Leviticus chapter 23, starting with verse 9. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old, without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord." And the grain offering with it shall be two-tenths of an ephah, of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma. And the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hen. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until the same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout all generations in all your dwellings. Now... There are four great feasts of the Jews. Okay? There are four great feasts of the Jews. We talked about one already this year. Okay? The Passover. The Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover. Uh, now that typically happens in correspondence with our calendar. That typically happens in March or April. Um, sometimes it differs uh, because the Jews, they followed a lunar calendar rather than a solar calendar. Okay? So sometimes it differs, but typically that happens in March or April. Now at the end of that feast is what we just read about in verses 9 um, through 14. 
At the end of that feast, they were to take the first grain that they had for the year, the first fruits, this first offering, they were to take it and wave it before the Lord. It was to be an offering, a sacrifice before the Lord. Okay, so they were supposed to take that first offering and wave it before the Lord. And then, seven weeks later, something else was going to happen. Notice verse 15. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, Okay. Seven weeks from that day, <clears throat> you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of the new grain to the Lord. And you shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two-tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd, and two rams. And they shall be a burnt offering to the Lord, with their grain offering and with their drink offerings, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So let's pause there. So, seven weeks, 49 days, plus one is 50. Fifty days after you make this, this offering of the first fruits, this wave offering after the Passover, okay, fifty days after that, you are going to have this celebration. And you are going to offer another offering of the harvest. The first one was the first fruits. Now you're going to bring the rest of your harvest. And you are going to offer that before the Lord. And there are some other, other sacrifices that we read about. Uh, the bull, the ram, and the bull, and the lambs, and the drink offering. And verse 19, you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering, and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of peace offering. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord, and the two lambs. And they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation, and you shall not do any work, any ordinary work. And it is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout all your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. So they're supposed to have this festival. You can uh, read more about this in Deuteronomy chapter 16. Okay? There's further reading in Deuteronomy chapter 16. But they're supposed to have this festival where they would celebrate the rest of the harvest, the completion of the harvest. Okay? They, they offered that first part of the harvest, and then 50, day, 50 days later, they're going to offer the rest of the harvest. And it's this celebration that God brought about the harvest and did what He said He was going to do. The wait was over. God had done a great and wonderful thing in resurrecting the Lord. God had done a great and wonderful thing in resurrecting the Lord. And now He was going to bring the rest of the harvest. God resurrected Jesus and now He's going to bring the rest of the harvest. And He's going to work a spiritual resurrection in us. And then one day... After the wait is completely over, He's going to work an actual resurrection in us, of our body. And the wait will be over. Christ was the first fruits, and we are the rest of the harvest. And so it's fitting that the beginning of the church, it's fitting that the beginning of God's kingdom on this earth the beginning of everything, the, the place where people begin to be saved in Christ Jesus, to be saved by faith, to be, to be saved and brought into a covenant with God, it's fitting that that happens on the day of Pentecost because it's saying that God brings the full harvest. He did a great thing in Jesus and He's going to continue to do a great thing in us. And so... I say to you, let God finish His harvest. Let God 
finish his harvest. It is a fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. And it is a fact that God wants to raise you from the dead. He does. God wants to raise you from the dead. Both spiritually and physically. He wants to make you a new creation in Christ. He wants to fix everything that has been broken. And he started that with the resurrection of Jesus. And he wants to work that in you today. I don't know what is broken in your life. Maybe you've got all kinds of problems, all kinds of worries, all kinds of anxieties, all kinds of sins. You've got all kinds of things that are going on in your life. Maybe, maybe your life is broken from a standpoint of trials and you just the bills keep coming in the mail and you don't know what you're going to be able to do about them. I, I don't know what the, the problem is in your life, but I want you to know that Jesus' resurrection should be a symbol of hope for you. And that you can become a new creation in Christ Jesus today. The wait is over. The harvest has begun. Offer yourself as the new grain offering. The wait is over. How do we do that? I want you to look at this famous passage in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the, the Feast of Weeks. I want you to look at Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Peter preaches a heartfelt sermon. He calls them to repentance. He, he, he says to them that, that Jesus is the Christ, that He died, that you are responsible for His death. He, he calls those people out and says, you are responsible for His death. But, but Peter emphasizes that Jesus was raised again and so in verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What do, what do we need to do? What do we need to do to respond to this? What do we need to do to allow the harvest to fully come? What do we need to do now that the wait is over, now that we've, we've waited these 50 days? Now that the harvest is here, how do we reap the harvest? How do we be offered as a new grain offering? What shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. And with many other words, He bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this quick, crooked generation. So those who received His word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. I don't know what you have going on, but I know the best way to fix it I know the best way to fix it is to allow God to work a new creation in you. To make you a new grain offering. To begin a new life for you. And so I would urge you today, if you haven't done that, if you haven't responded to the resurrection of Christ, you need to. You need to. Christ is risen, risen indeed. And He wants to raise you, raise you indeed. He wants to create new life in you. He wants to do it today. I want us to remember something. We are a kind of first fruits as well. And we are in a harvest period now as well. We are responsible for the harvest as well. James chapter 1 verse 18 says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 
You see, there will come a day when God will make all things new, when He will renew all things, when uh, the, the corrupt world in which we live will be done away with and all things will become new. And we are the first fruits of that. God is making us new if we have responded to His harvest and become a new creation. Romans chapter 8 puts it this way, verses 18 through 25, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willing, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. A curse was laid upon all of creation when Adam and Eve did what they did. And so there is a longing that th those things will be made new, that those things will be fixed. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the, the, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what, is seen, for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. One day, one day, the harvest will be over. And God will renew all things. And the wheat will be collected into God's barn and the tares will be sent out and burned up. And so the harvest is coming. And we who have been redeemed in Christ are the first fruits. And so right now we're in, metaphorically speaking, the 50 days in between the resurrection and Pentecost. And we're waiting for the full, for the full harvest. Right now, the harvest is on. As we conclude our service today, Hamilton's going to read a scripture from, uh, from Matthew chapter 9 in just a little bit. And I want you to pay close attention to that scripture. I want you to pay close attention to that scripture because we are in the middle of the harvest and we have the opportunity, the privilege, the obligation to go out and to bring people in for the harvest. To go out and to reap souls for God, to go out and to get people ready for when God makes all things new. So, today, today I say to you, this day of Pentecost, this day of new life, this day of fresh wind, this day of, of fire in the Holy Spirit, today I say to you, to reap the harvest for your soul. To respond to God's message. To become a new grain offering for God. The wait is over. Christ is risen. And you should be risen too. And I also say to you that there are others who need to be risen as well. Many, many others. It could be your neighbor it could be your family member, it could be uh, your child, it could be your grandchild, it could be your enemy, it could be the person that you see at the bank, it could be the person who's in the window at the drive through it could be anybody who needs to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. So today, let us be saved. Let us be a new creation. And let us realize that we are in the harvest right now and we have to go out and find people who are ready for harvest to be a new creation, a new grain offering for the Lord on this day, the Feast of Weeks. We're going to sing an invitation song.
We sang one last week. It had been a while before we'd had uh, been a been a while since we'd had a an invitation song. We're going to sing an invitation song. We need to respond to this message. If you've been waiting to have your problems fixed, to have a new lease on life, to find a solution to your broken life, the wait is over. Christ is risen, and He wants to raise you. Won't you please come as we stand and as we sing?